So when I was in college, I was a part of a campus ministry called Crew, and we had a weekly gathering every Thursday night, and uh, we had about 20 to 25 students who would show up to this gathering, and our weekly gathering was, was very similar to what we do here on Sunday mornings. There was a time of teaching that came from the scriptures, we sang a little bit, had a few songs, and then there was some fellowship time. And uh, Crew was an evangelistic outreach, um, and so every once in a while you would get new students who came to check it out, who hadn't been there before, but usually they would come because they were invited by another student. Well, on this particular night, two students just kind of wandered in who had never been there before. Uh, I recognized at least one of them because I had seen them in a class or across campus. The other one I, I didn't know, and obviously I just went over and I said hi to them. I began to introduce myself to them and find out who they were and ask them why that they were there and what they were looking to find. And they just said, oh, we're just, we're just here to check it out and see what it's all about. And I said, great. Now, again, our, our normal evening looked like we would something we would do here, but I told them, like, here's what we typically do, and I said, but tonight's a little bit different. Tonight we're, we're doing a game night and just hanging out. And as soon as I said game night, one of them kind of, like, made this face, like, game night? Like, I'm not hanging around for game night. And so during, like, the fellowship time, he kind of, like, snuck away and left, and I, I didn't see him the rest of the evening. But the other guy, he, he stuck with it, and he was like, all right, well, game night. I guess that's what we're going to do. Uh, and that night we played a game called Four on a Cat. Anybody familiar with Four on a Couch? Yeah, it's this, it's this fun, like, classic youth group, college ministry game. The way you play is you sit in a circle. So everybody's in a circle. And sometimes you actually bring a couch into the circle. But if you don't have a couch, you designate four chairs to be the couch. And there's always an open seat. There's one open seat always throughout the circle. And so the person sitting to the right of the open seat calls a name. Now, before the game starts, you write, everybody writes their name on a slip of paper, you put it in a hat, and then you pass the hat around, and you take a random name out of the hat, and you hold that name. So when the person who's the, to the right of the empty seat calls a name, the name they call that person, not, who ha, not whose name it is, but the name on your paper, you stand up, and you go sit in that empty chair. And then when you sit down, you exchange names with the person who called you. So now that means there's another, that, that empty chair has moved to another part of the circle. The person to the right of that calls a name. That person who's got the name on the paper goes and sits down. They swap names, and, and you just keep doing that. Now the way you win the game is usually you play guys against girls. And if you get four guys on the couch or four girls on the couch, that's how you win. They, like the open chair is always changing, so it could be that it's on the couch, the person to the right calls the name, and it's always just moving around, and it's a confusing game. Anybody confused as I explain this game? <laughs> right. That's the point of the game. It's a hard game, and you've got to like, who's who, and what's what, and how do I get there? So back to the new guy, right? Like he walks in that night thinking he's going to be able to sit in the back and kind of be unseen and he's just going to observe things and kind of slip out when he wants or slip out if he wants. And now he's agreed to stay for game night and he's found himself sitting in a circle, looking at people face to face, playing a game where you need to know people's names in the group in order to call a name. And he's probably sitting there like, how anxious as I'll get out? Like, how, how am I going to play this game? Like, who, whose name am I going to call? Am I just going to call a random name? Now, because the game is so confusing, sometimes it can take a while. That evening, it took us over an hour to complete that game. And the person who was leading the evening, as soon as we finished that game, said, okay, and transitioned us to the next game. And as soon as that happened, this guy shot up. And he's like, hey, this has been great, but I got to go. And he literally, like, ran out the room, and we never saw him again. <laughs> Now, I give him credit for hanging in there, right? Because you're, here you are in a group of 20, 25 people you don't know. You're expecting one thing. It turns out to be something else. And he hung in there for quite some time. But I think that moment illustrates a tension we've probably all faced before. And it's the tension of, hey, I want to connect. I want to be in relationship. I want to be a part of community but I don't know if I want to just thrust myself into community because I don't necessarily know what I'm walking into. I don't know if I'm going to walk into a worship service or if it's game night, what do I do, right? 
And we've probably all found ourselves in that place before. Like, it's hardwired in us to want to connect and be in relationship and be known and know other people and walk alongside people through life. Like, we are hardwired that way. But sometimes, in order to truly connect in community, we have to step outside our comfort zone. We have to move towards people even when we're unsure of who they are or how they're going to react to us. And my guess is we probably all have experienced that somewhere along the way. We long for community and we're trying hard to find it. Every year, as we go through one calendar year, at least somewhere along the way every year, I meet people who come to our church and they say, hey, I've moved here from another city, out of state, a job took me here, I'm here for school, and I know nobody. And I'm trying to find my place, and that's why I'm here at Meadowbrook, to see if my people are here, right? I, I always find people, as again, we move through the year, there are people who are checking out our church because they're just in the process of looking for a new church. And I've never met somebody who's looking for a new church come in and say, you know, I am so excited about this search. It's going to take me about six months, I imagine, and I'm going to bounce around from one community to the next, and I just can't wait to meet all these new people and feel like I'm floundering and I don't know where I belong. Like most people are like, I dread looking for a new church because finding community is really, really hard. It, and it requires some effort and investment and engagement on our part. But it's not just looking to belong in community that's difficult. Like living in community can also be difficult because people are people and people can be awkward and people can sometimes be hard to love and, and sometimes you have to work through somebody else's junk if you're really going to be in relationship with them and that can be hard and so all of that raises the question when it comes to searching for community it raises the question is it worth it? Is it worth it? Maybe it would just be easier for me to hang out by myself, not have to step outside my comfort zone, not have to try and get along with difficult people. Maybe I should just stay by myself and everything would be much easier that way. Is it worth it to pursue and belong in community? Well, our passage today kind of navigates some of that issue and Paul will go on to tell us whether or not it truly is worth it to be in community. And this is the way our passage begins. This is chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, starting in verse 17. Paul writes, But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought. So Paul's in this section of the letter where he's talking about what it was like for him to spend time in Thessalonica with this new church. And during this section, as he's reflecting on his time with them, he uses lots of family language to describe his experience with them. Like right here, he says brothers and sisters. He repeats that phrase all over the place in this letter. Earlier in chapter 2, he will say that he was like a, a mother amongst them, caring for a young child. He will also use the metaphor of a father trying to encourage his kids as he describes what it was like for him to be in community with the Thessalonians. He, he paints this picture of warm and connected relationships, right? And the tone of this letter is rather upbeat and positive, which could easily give us the impression that living in community is one big warm and fuzzy group hug all the time, right? It's like if you have a friend who's got a boat and he's like, hey, let's go on Lake Michigan for the weekend. We're going to go hang on my boat. And you're just like living it up on his boat. It's a beautiful day. It's sunshiny. It's like, ah, oh, this is great. Or if you have a friend who has a cabin up north and like, hey, come join us at the cabin for the weekend. We're going to hang out. We're going to barbecue. We're going to spend time. You're just like, ah, community, right? It's amazing, right? Sometimes we paint community and living life in community as though it's just fun and glorious all the time. But notice how Paul describes how he's feeling in this moment. He says, when we were orphaned, by being separated from you. Right, so the story of Paul's time 
in Thessalonica is captured in Acts 17. He was there just a few weeks. It wasn't uncommon for Paul to spend a year or more in certain cities, but he was in Thessalonica a few weeks because he started to preach the gospel, started to gather new believers, and right away, town officials, people in power didn't like it, riots were caused, and he was forced out because of hardship and persecution, and now he's found himself separated from those in Thessalonica, and he says he feels orphaned because he's separated from them. And so being orphaned is a really strong term. It's a weighty term. Sometimes we think of like Orphan Annie, right? Cute red dress, puffy hair. Mr. Warbucks is going to save the day, right? But being orphaned is painful. It's weighty. It's hard. It's also traumatic. Paul is using that language to describe how he's feeling. Uh, my youngest daughter, Lucy, and I have been reading a couple of books over this last year called, uh, titled, The War That Saved My Life and The War I fi Finally Won. It's a story of a young girl named Ada who's living during World War II in London. And because of the war and the fear that the Germans might attack London, any kid living in London is evacuated from London and sought, brought to the countryside to live in a host home for a season. And Ada has a very challenging relationship with her mother. She has a disabled foot, and her mother is abusive. Her mother is ashamed of her disabled foot, had an opportunity to fix her disabled foot, but didn't believe it was worth it. And the way that Ada's mom would discipline her is that she would keep her locked inside the house all day, and for even more severe punishment, she would lock her in a cabinet underneath the sink. And so Ada has all this trauma in her life, because of her mom. She's separated from her mom because of the war, and in the opening to the second book, she's finally getting her disabled leg fixed, and she gets word that a bomb exploded in London and killed her mom. And you would expect, like, maybe she would be happy because her mom is now gone, and she now is free from her mom's care, but she finds herself disoriented. Like, to whom do I belong? Where do I belong? Sure, there's this other woman who's taking care of me right now, but I don't have anybody. And she sits in that. And there's this discussion in the second chapter of that second book about what it means to be orphaned and how Ada is now an orphan, and she just feels the weight of that. That's the term that Paul is using to describe this separation that he is experiencing from those in Thessalonica. Now, he's not saying they've caused this trauma and he's feeling it because of them, but because of his love for them, he's feeling that. He's trying to paint this picture that life and community isn't always rainbows, lollipops, and butterflies. Sometimes it's hard and painful. He goes on to say in verse, uh, the rest of verse 17, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. So again, Paul is saying that the trauma that he's feeling isn't because of the Thessalonians. He's describing his desire to reconnect with them. And he says he has this intense longing. It's almost as though he has this ache deep in his gut. He's concerned about them. He's worried about them. Right? He was forced out of the city. They are new believers, recently converted. He's wondering, do they have what it takes to stay the course? Because the persecution and hardship that they experienced while Paul was there wasn't going to immediately evaporate once Paul was gone. Paul knows that they're going to still continually face that hardship and those trials. And my guess is it probably keeps him up at night. He's probably worried about what's happening to those believers that have left, and it's causing him great anguish and distress. See, what Paul is trying to capture here is that community has a cost. There's a cost to being in community. He uses the language of being orphaned, and he uses this term of being um, concerned, saying he has this intense longing, this intense ache as he cares about them. So it means when you enter into community, you're opening yourself up to something that might cost you. 
Relationships cost something. There's the expectation to be in true relationship. You have to open yourself up and make yourself vulnerable, which means you might get hurt, which means people might disappoint you, which means people might walk out on you and leave you, which means like the mess that they are experiencing, like if you're truly going to be in community with them, you might have to take on and shoulder some of that mess. And the question is, are, are we willing to do that? If you really want to be in community, if you really want to be a part of Meadowbrook Church, are you willing to open yourself up to that? Which again raises the question, like if community has a cost, like is it worth it? Is it worth it to really invest my time, my energy into a group of people where somewhere along the way it might be difficult, it might be painful, it might be a little uncomfortable? Is it worth it? But notice what Paul says next. Not only does he feel orphaned as he's separated from those in Thessalonica, and he has this intense ache and longing, he goes on to say this in verse 19. He says, For what is our hope, what is our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? See, Paul uses this metaphor of being orphaned to capture how he's feeling as a re result of being separated from the church in Thessalonica. But in verse 19, he introduces another metaphor. It's the metaphor of a crown. What is our hope? What is our joy? What is the crown, he says? Now, when we hear the word crown, we probably think of a king or a queen sitting on a throne. They have their scepter in their hand, and they have this beautiful, ornate crown on their head as they're on their throne, right? Yesterday was the coronation of King Charles in England. And I don't know if you saw any footage or any photos of the day, but it's this big ornate ceremony. He's sitting on his throne and somewhere along the way they put this big, beautiful red velvet crown, this white like trail around it on his head and it was this ceremonious part of him being king. That's not what Paul is talking about here. Because in Greek, there are two words for crown. There is the word diadema, which we get our English word diadem from. And if you're familiar, if you're like an, a fan of old hymns, you might remember the hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, right? Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem. And what? Crown him Lord of all. Right? That's where we get our word diadem from. Diadema is one Greek word for crown. Paul isn't using that here. There's another Greek word for crown, Stephanos. That's the word that he's using, and that's a word that's used to describe somebody who wins an athletic competition, and what they get is a prize. They get a crown, a wreath put on their head as a symbol of being the victor. It would be like somebody winning first place in the Olympics, and they get a gold medal hung around their neck. In the ancient world, it was a wreath around their head, and so Paul is saying, what is our crown? What is this thing that we've won? What's our reward? What's our prize? And what does he say he's hoping this crown will do for him? He says, what is the crown in which we glory? He's anticipating that this crown will bring him glory. Now, in the same way that there are multiple Greek words used for crown, there are also multiple Greek words for glory. Like one word is doxa, which is where we get our English word doxology. And then there's another Greek word, kauhesis, which also can be translated glory. So doxa would be giving somebody glory, giving somebody honor, renown, recognition because of who they are, the position that they hold, the respect that they are due. But kauhesis is this idea of rejoicing or boasting. Sometimes it's translated boasting. So if I'm an athlete and I work hard to take first place, the glory I'm hoping to receive is the boasting, and maybe even I can boast in myself to say, I worked for this, I put myself out there, I trained every day, I wanted to win the prize, I claim the prize, it's mine, I'm the victor, right? It's this idea of boasting and rejoicing in your victory. Because you have this prize, this crown that shows you are first place. So Paul is using that word, kauhesis, to describe this crown 
that he hopes to receive. Now again, the crown is just a metaphor. He's not talking about a literal crown. He's using it as a metaphor to describe what? He says, what is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown in which we glory? He goes on to say this, the last part of verse 19. He goes, is it not you? He says, indeed, you are our glory and joy. He's using this idea of crown, a prize in which we boast in glory to talk about the church in Thessalonica. He's saying, you're the thing that brings us joy. You're our prize. You give us cause for celebration. We have seen what God has done in you, and we are over the moon about it. See, not only does community have a cost, the reason why community is worth it is because community brings celebration. Specifically, celebrating what God has done. Because when I'm the victor, when I've won, when I've claimed my prize, it's all about me. But in community, none of us stands at the center of the community. It's Jesus who stands at the center of our community. And the reason that we're in this together is because of him, because of what he's done in our lives, because he's redeemed us. And Paul is saying the reason we rejoice in you is because we've had a front row seat to the work of God that he has done in your life to bring you to this point. So you're our prize. You're our glory because of what Jesus has done in you. We are so over the moon to have seen a front row seat, to have a front row seat, to see what he has done. And it's amazing, he's saying, we're not boasting in ourselves. We're not even boasting in you. We're boasting in what Jesus has done in you. It's a very different way to think about receiving a prize and receiving a crown and boasting in somebody else. Because oftentimes in our world, it's all about boasting in ourselves rather than in other people. But in community, we get the chance to celebrate and rejoice in others. So when I was in high school, I, I played football, and one of the positions that I played was a, a kick returner. So whenever there was a punt or a kickoff, like I would stand way back in the field, I would catch the ball, and after you catch the ball, you have one job, and it's to run. <laughs> to run as fast and as far as you can. And if you can run 10 yards, that's pretty good. If you can run 15 yards, even better. If you can run 20 yards, which for all you math whizzes out there, if a football field is 100 yards, 20 yards, one-fifth, 20% of the field is really good. Because you have 11 other people on the other team who are trying really hard not to have you run at all. And so you just get the ball and you go. Now, to run beyond 20 yards is almost impossible, but every once in a while, you can break a tackle, you can make a move, and you can zigzag your way to the end zone. So one time, I catch the ball. And I just start to go. I go five yards. I go 10 yards. I go 15 yards. And I'm still running. And at this point, I'm like, oh, I just got one job. Run. And somewhere along the way, I realized, like, I'm still running. I run 30 yards. I run 40 yards. I'm like, I'm still running. And I look back. I'm like, there's nobody around me. And I trotted my way into the end zone. It was the highlight of my football career. One of the best moments ever. Because it's near impossible to run a punt return or a kick return back for a touchdown. Now, in the NFL, even harder, because these guys are like massive who are chasing you down, but there's one individual who is the best, who was the best at returning kicks for a touchdown um, because he has the record for it. His name is Devin Hester, played for the Bears, boo. (laughs) But has a record of 20 touchdowns that he returned from a kickoff. And the night that he did it, he broke that record. He's got 20 of them. It was September 18th, 2014. And you're probably like, wow, Brian, that's really impressive that you have that sort of recall. I'm like, yeah. Well, I looked it up this week. That's why I know. <laughs> but the night that he ran that, touch, that kick return back for a touchdown, the guy whose record he broke, Deion Sanders, Mr. Primetime himself, was at the game. Not only was he at the game, he was one of the broadcasters 
for the game, sitting in the broadcast booth. So Devin Hester runs his touchdown, breaks the record. There's this big celebration, and of course, they bring him up to the broadcast booth after the game is over. He's sitting in the middle, and there's a guy who's kind of like the lead anchor for the show. He starts to talk about Devin Hester and talk about you know, Deion Sanders and the, the record that he had and that Devin Hester broke it. And Deion Sanders is sitting right next to Devin Hester. And he said, most people don't want their records to be broken. Most people want to hold on to the record. Why? Because they want the glory. They, they want the boasting. Like, ah, he's the record holder. And this guy, this anchor, looks at Devin Hester and he says, you're never going to believe what happened tonight. Before the game, Deion Sanders was praying for you and praying that you would break his record. That you got to know how much he loves you. And how over the moon excited he is for you that you now have the record. And then the camera cuts to Deion Sanders. He puts his hand on Devin Hester. And, and this is the point where you realize they have this pre-existing relationship. They're in communication and they talk all the time. And Deion Sanders starts to get emotional. He's like, man, I love you so much. I am so excited for you. If there's anybody who ever were to break my record, I would want it to be you. I love you as a friend. I love you as a player. I love you as a father. He can't talk anymore. He's like, I just love you so much. And Paul is saying here, like, you're our joy. You're our crown. We love you more than you could ever imagine. And I know, without a shadow of a doubt, we all want that love in our lives, right? But we all want to be delighted in like that. And it's in, it's supposed to be at least, the community of the church where we find that. Not only from Jesus Christ, but because we know of what Jesus has done for us, we are called to extend that same love and celebration and joy to others, even at the expense of ourselves, even when it costs us something. Because the hope is we know and have confidence that it will someday come around to us, that we live in this community of unconditional giving and receiving of love and joy. You're my crown. You're my joy. You're my prize. Because I see what Jesus has done in you, and I get to play a small part of it. Why wouldn't I want to be in on that? Paul is saying that, sure, community has a cost, but it also is cause for celebration because of who God is and what he has done in our lives. Now, the temptation with that is to say, I enter into community only to get that. The reason why I'm here is to get that joy, to get that love, to get that celebration. But Paul then quickly reminds us as we wind this passage down, not only does community have a cost, not only does community cause celebration, but it also requires commitment. And see, what Paul is saying here is that living in community is worth the cost. Living in community is worth the cost and it's worth the commitment. So if we had a projector working this morning, this is where I put on the screen like the slide with my big idea that it would say big idea and make it really clear that this is what I'm trying to communicate to you today. So this is what I'm trying to communicate to you today, that Paul is saying living in community is worth the cost. Even when it comes with commitment. Because this is how he winds the passage down. He says this. This is verse 1 starting chapter 3. He says, So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy. Notice three we's there, right? Paul always traveled with companions. He always traveled with people. And that we there is at least referring to himself, Silas, and Timothy. Maybe he had other companions. But he starts this letter naming those names. And they together made a decision to send Timothy back to Thessalonica. They're, they're separated. They're forced out. Paul is concerned that they're not doing well. He sends Timothy to get a report. And then he says, here's what he hopes Timothy will do. There's a commitment that Timothy has to bringing something to this church. And he says he hopes at least he'll do this thing. We sent Timothy, our brother and co-worker, in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. See, again, the backstory to 1 Thessalonians is that Paul underwent hardship, trial, and persecution and was forced out. 
And now that church also is going to continue to receive that hardship, trial, and persecution. And when you're doing something new, because they've probably only been believers for a few weeks, and it's hard, and it's difficult, there's the temptation to quit. And Paul is saying, we're sending Timothy to encourage you and strengthen you so you don't give up. Over the last two weekends, Becky and I have sat in the cold rain four times watching our kids play soccer. Any, anybody else have to do that the last couple of weekends? It's like, oh, not another. I mean, why can't it be like this every time they play? Four games bundled up, soaking wet. And there was a game yesterday. We could see we were watching Emma's team play. It's like the rain started to come hard at the end of the game. And it was just like they wanted to quit. They wanted to be done. Like they're literally like squinting as they're running for the ball, like shielding their face to try and just kick it. And there was one girl in particular. I mean, she was just struggling she was having a hard time, and we all felt bad for her because you could tell she just wanted to, like, put on her coat, get in her car, and go home. And so we didn't know her name yet. Like, you, as, as a parent, you learn the player's name so you can cheer for, her, cheer for them. So I'm like, what's her name? What's we all, like, started asking, and finally we fi figured out her name was Allison. So every time she got near the ball, we're like, come on, Allison, you can do it. Because it's one thing to say, hey, you, go for it. But it's another thing to say, Allison, come on, and call her by name. And you could tell when she heard her name, it was like she got energy. She got, like, she picked up her, like, oh, I can do this. She ran harder. She ran faster. She kicked harder. Because when you're going through something hard and somebody comes alongside of you and says, hey, I see this is hard. And they call you by name. And they say, I'm in it with you. It gives you strength and courage to keep going forward. And Paul is saying that living in community requires a commitment to that. That when things get hard for other people, when their lives get messy, and it looks like it's difficult for them, rather than saying, good luck with that, we move towards them and we say, hey, I'm in it with you. We will work it through and it's going to be okay. And then he goes on to say this, right? He never gives them any idea that following Jesus would be easy. He actually tells them the exact opposite. It is going to be hard because he goes on to say, the second half of verse 3, For you know quite well that we are destined for them, them being hardships, trials, and persecutions. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. See, Paul is saying when you're in community, when you're really in it and you're committed to it, it comes with a commitment to strengthen and, and encourage each other, but also to be honest with each other and to tell each other the truth. Because that's what he says in verse 4. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you. He kept saying, this is going to be hard. It's going to feel like an uphill battle. It's not going to be easy. Paul tells them repeatedly the truth. One of the greatest gifts that we can receive from people is the truth. The truth about who we are. The truth about what we need. The truth about our circumstances. And who God is with us in the midst of it. Because sometimes the truth is hard. Sometimes we don't want to hear the truth. Sometimes we don't want to be told the things that are true about us in the way that we're disruptive, or we're awkward, or we're unaware, or we don't know how to love people, or that there's sin in our life, or that we're making bad decisions that's actually harming us. Like, sometimes it's easier just to, like, avoid that. Deny that truth and pretend it's not there. Or when we do see it and experience it, we cope with it so we don't actually have to deal with it. Paul is saying, no, no, no. What it means to be in community with people is to be truth tellers, to tell each other the truth in a compassionate, caring, loving way. One of the greatest gifts you can have is somebody in your life who can actually tell you the truth about what's going on in your life, maybe sometimes the truth that you can't see. And one of the realities in following Jesus, one of the truths is that we have great need. Like we are people who are in deep need of community, of a relationship with God. We have a deep need for salvation 
because there's all of this sin in our life that sometimes we bring into community that actually causes the breakdown of community. And we need to be told like, hey, 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 like we can do this differently. Hey, there's grace to be extended here. There's forgiveness that you need to offer. There's a realization that it's not always all about you. And if you can have somebody in your life who can share those things with you, it could be one of the greatest gifts that God could ever give you. But that's hard. There's a cost to that. Sometimes it's difficult and awkward. But the beautiful thing about the church is that Jesus stands at the center of it. And Jesus is always about redemption. He's always about redeeming things, redeeming relationships, redeeming people, to bring them into new life. And one of the ways that we receive that is by laying down whatever sin is besetting us, by letting go of our pride and owning up to where we fall short and to walking with people in community towards the cross to say it's only because of him and what he has done and the way that he has brought my life back from the grave. That's worth celebrating. And what's, what's the really good news about the gospel is that in the same way that community costs us something, it costs Jesus everything. In the way that we're called to commit to one another Jesus was radically, wildly committed to us to the point that he gave his own life to redeem us from sin and death that we might find true lasting life in him. And that's something wildly worth celebrating. And so the way that we're going to end is two questions, one question and one response. And that question is, where do you need to engage in community? Like here, like where do you need to take your next step? Rather than just coming in on a Sunday and leaving, where do you need to take that next step to in intersect your lives with somebody else? Maybe it's joining a group of some kind. Maybe it's serving and giving back and contributing. Maybe it's just trying to sit. And somebody told me this after first service. Just sit in a new spot and meet somebody new, Right? Because some of you, I look out and I'm like, you're in the same spot every week. You're in the same spot every week. I always do that. Like, go sit somewhere else. Meet somebody new. Build a relationship. Get a friend, right? And then the other thing is, do we see that Jesus is holding this all together? Because it's all about him. Because it's all for him. So where do you need to take your next step? And how do you need to keep moving towards Jesus? And so the way that we're going to respond this morning is by going before the Lord's Supper. Because in this simple meal, we see that this is the cost that Jesus paid. He gave his life for us. In this simple meal, we're reminded that we're bound together in him, through him, because of what he has done on the cross for us. In this simple meal of the bread and the cup, it demonstrates how much he loves us. And when we receive that love, it's supposed to change us so that we extend it to others. And in the process, we have to reflect, like, where am I looking to get rather than give? And so in just a moment, our ushers are going to uh, come up. They're going to dismiss you row by row. We're going to invite you to go before the Lord's table to take the elements. You'll see in the trays that there are two cups stacked on top of each other. You're going to want to take both cups because one has the bread, one has the juice. There's also prepackaged elements on each station if you'd rather take those. All the stations are the same. So come up when you're dismissed. Go before each station, one station. Take the elements and then return to your seats through the side aisle. And when everybody has received the elements, I'll come up. We'll take them all together and then we'll finish out our service. But let's pray before we go before the Lord's table. Lord, we thank you so much for what this meal symbolizes. We thank you so much for what you have done on our behalf by going to the cross, by giving your life so that we could ultimately have redemption in you and so that we could ultimately be in relationship with one another with you at the center. Lord, as we go before your table, I pray that we would reflect on ways that we have contributed to the breakdown of community that our sin gets in our way and it causes breakdown in relationship. May we turn from that sin. May we name it, own it, and repent from it to say, Lord, I want to do life differently. 
and I want to continue to move towards you. So we offer this moment to you as an act of worship to say we're offering ourselves in the same way that you offered yourself for us. Pray this in your name. Amen.